and I'm there right now, okay? So we're going to pray first. Does that sound good? Let's, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for today, and I just, uh, I just pray you, uh, you bless us and guide us and lead us as we seek uh, truth, as we, as we think and, 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 and pray and wrestle and, and, and discuss and do all those things that's just involved in growing. God, uh, I just just pray that you will you'll bless us and help us as we seek to as we seek to grow. And God, uh, I just pray that you will guide what what I say uh, so that it is helpful. I, I do pray that this morning will be helpful in that process as, of us uh, of growing to to know you. Thank you so much for your love and for your grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. You might want to uh, maybe get out a little piece of paper and a pen or something because. For some of you, especially those of you who are church folks, who kind of grew up in church and that kind of thing, there's probably going to be some questions that come up along the way that you're going to lay down. What about this? What about this? What about this? Just scribble those down as we go, because uh, I'm, I'm hopefully we'll try to address some of those things that I won't be able to directly address uh, when, we, when we come together Wednesday night and do some I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, especially for those of you who grew up in church, I want to want to ask you to finish a song lyric for me. Okay, you don't be shy. Just 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 belt it out. I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna ask you to just finish it for me. Okay, you ready? Here it goes. Jesus loves me. This I know. Very good, very good. Y'all are very good church people, very good Sunday school uh, attenders. That's awesome. Uh, Most of us, even if we didn't go to church a whole lot when we were a kid, we kind of know that song. Now, let me ask you this. Has that song ever bothered you? Ever disturbed you? Uh, A couple of you are shaking your heads. Okay, but a couple of us, this did. Once I became an adult, this song kind of, just a little bit, I mean, it's a great song, but it just, something bothered me about it. Okay, I know Jesus loves me, because the Bible tells me so. Okay. Why do I know that the Bible is telling me the truth? You know, that, that was the question behind the deal. It's like, okay, the Bible tells me so, but how do I know that what the Bible says is, is right? Why do I put my, my trust in this? I don't have a book anymore. I'm carrying around a phone. In this book that's on this phone, okay? Why do I put my trust in, in this book? book, how do I know that it's telling me uh, the truth? Especially when there are things in that book that if they were in any other book, I would go, that's not right. That can't be right. God can't be like that. That's just, to- that's just totally off, totally wrong. Or there's things in there where if they were in any other book, I would go, that's just fantasy. There's no way that happened. There's ab- absolutely no way. Oh, if those kinds of things are in there, why do I, why do I believe it here? So, when I started seriously questioning my faith, uh, when I especially, my, I started in high school, but especially my early college years, really questioning, really doubting, really struggling with what I believed, uh, a lot of my doubts and questions centered on this book we call the Bible. And so I began this search, trying to, to figure out, okay, is the Bible God's Word? Is this book, is this really God's Word? Now, what I was really saying is, is this Bible, is this book God's Word in the way that I understood as a child? Okay? Is this, is this book what I've always thought it was growing up as a child? Which the idea I had of the Bible was that God's Holy Spirit basically whispered into these different writers' ears and told them, maybe just through their brain waves, told them what to say. And they wrote it down. And so everything that was written down is directly from the mouth of God. So if, if that's the case, then of course there could be no inconsistencies in Scripture, no contradictions, no, no you know, mistakes of any kind. The, all the teaching had to be in harmony because it was from the same God directly. Yeah, different writers and all that kind of stuff, but it, it is, it is the, the Word of God in that way. And so there cannot be any what we call problems in it. But then I started reading the Bible, because I'd read the Bible all my life, but I started the re- reading the Bible as a questioner. As a, as a searcher, as, a, as an even a skeptic. And the Bible just didn't read the way that I had 
always been taught or just assumed that the Bible should read. It was way messier than that. Definitely in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Uh, I had been taught or main, mainly just assumed that the Bible was an instruction manual. Have you ever heard the you know, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, that kind of thing? The Bible is an instruction manual. It was that blueprint for life. This is what you should know and believe and this is what you should do. And yet it didn't read like an instruction manual. It had some great instruction in it, but it just didn't read like that. I'd been taught that all the teachings of the Bible were in complete harmony. They all went together. There was no you know, you know, contradiction in teaching. And yet, when I read, that there were some things that I just, even in the New Testament, struggled to bend to make work together. And in the Old Testament, just things that just seemed completely opposed to one another. What is going on with this? So over time, I began to be convinced that if the Bible was God's Word, which I did believe and which I, I do believe the Bible is God's Word, but that it must be God's Word in a different way than what I had always assumed as a kid. So I began on a journey, and I'm going to tell you right now, I am still on that journey. Hadn't figured it all out. I, not only do I not know uh, all the answers to it, I don't even think I know all the answers to it. That's, that's important. You know, that's, a, that's a big deal for me not to even believe that I know all the answers to it. I know that I don't. I'm still on that journey. But here's something I discovered very early, that anchored my faith, that helped me stay on the path of faith in God, even when my faith in the Bible, as I understood it, wavered. And that is this, that the Bible is a witness to Jesus Christ. And I believe in Jesus for more reasons than simply the Bible tells me so. So let's, let's just begin with the beginning of Christianity really quick. I'm going to go as quickly as I can. Christianity began when a man named Jesus appeared in the land we call Israel in the first century AD. And he created quite a stir with his teaching and with his healings and acts of power that people said that he did that were these amazing things they spoke about. He also spoke strongly against the religious leaders and disturbed the power structure of the current Jewish system at the time so much so that they decided he must be eliminated. Not only was he developing this huge following, but he was opposed to their way of doing things and he had to be gone. And so they convinced enough people and they convinced the Roman governor Jesus had to be Eliminated, And not only was he eliminated, but he was crucified. This torturous, humiliating criminal's death that completely discredited everything Jesus had ever said. And so Jesus' followers went home dejected and de devastated, without, without a direction. The people who had, had thought, Jesus, maybe, maybe this is the one that we've been waiting for, realized, okay, guess, guess the leaders were right. He's just another would-be Messiah. That wasn't all he was cracked up to be. And then a few days later, some people began to say that they saw him. In fact, the first group of people that said they saw him was a group of women. Now, this is not offensive here. This is just the way it was, okay? If you wanted to tell a makeup story that you wanted people to believe, you did not have the first witnesses be women, okay? Because women were not believed in that male-dominated culture. A woman's testimony could not convict anybody in a court of law at that time in that culture, okay? Women were not considered reliable. So you just don't make up a story and make the witnesses women. Unless perhaps it happened that way and you just tell what happened. Okay, that was just a side note. That's for free. Okay, so there's these pockets of people begin to say, we saw Jesus. We, we sat down with Jesus. I ate with Jesus. He was as real as you are to me right now. We did this. And, and over a period of 40 days, people began to say, Jesus was with me and I talked to him. We did this stuff together. At the end of that 40 days, he met with a big group of them, gave them this mission to go and spread the good news about him. And then he left. A few days later, these people began telling everybody what they had seen. And thousands of people in Jerusalem, quickly, I mean, there was I mean, a huge movement right at the beginning of people becoming Christians, followers of Jesus, because there was about 500 people in that area saying, 
I saw him. I was there. This is what he told me. And all of a sudden, the re all the things that Jesus had said, all the things that Jesus did began to make sense, and they began telling about it. And people believed them. Not everybody. A lot of people believed them. Well, why? Well, for one thing, they were doing some of the same acts of power that Jesus had done, healing people and such like that. But even more than that, these people were the same ones who had abandoned Jesus when things got rough, who had been completely devastated when he was crucified, and now they were willing to be beaten, flogged, imprisoned, and killed, and would not renounce the fact that, no, Jesus is Lord. He really is true. He's the Son of God. He shows us who God is. I was there. I know it. And because of that conviction, it spread. Now, if anybody knew that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, it was those followers. But they went to their death. If they, if they were lying, they knew it was a lie, and they were willing to die for a lie. And I simply don't believe that that many people were willing to die for something they knew was a lie. So, so Christianity spread, and, and it, it even went beyond just the Jewish people and started going to the Gentile people. Uh, people like Paul, the Apostle Paul, started go going on these trips to places far away, telling people about Jesus and be planting churches, beginning churches here, there, churches being planted everywhere. And here's the kicker. They had no Bible. Okay, get this? They had no Bible. Now, if they were Jews, they had the Old Testament, you know, and now they were, if they were Christian, they, they were reading the Old Testament in light of Jesus, and so they changed the way they read the Old Testament. But these people, they, they had no New Testament. They had no Bible. And so the church was being planted and grew, in fact, grew for a couple hundred years before anybody had what we consider the New Testament. In fact, they were all, all these books collected together as one. So the early church began that way. And so you can understand when Paul or the Apostle Peter or Apostle John started writing letters to these churches that had been planted, when the, when the you know, churches got these, you know, so many of them had not even seen an eyewitness because they were, that was been separated. They were living far away. And here they got these letters from the apostles. And they, they treasured those things. They, copied, they hand copied those things. No printing press, right? So they hand copied those things tens of thousands of times. And those just spread throughout the churches all over the, the known world there. Well, within you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of the time when Jesus left, people began to say, you know, we need to write this stuff down. We've been passing, the eyewitnesses have been passing on all these stories about Jesus, and we've been telling them and retelling, but we need to write this stuff down. And so a lot of people did. They began collecting these stories. They began writing them down, you know, making accounts of the things that Jesus did. But there were four of those accounts that the church began to consider especially important because of who they were written by. The Apostle Matthew wrote what we know as the Gospel of Matthew, and he wrote the story of Jesus to Jewish Christians. Uh, Mark was not an apostle, but he did a lot of traveling with Paul and with Peter. And so he wrote this, this more brief account of the story of Jesus. Luke, he traveled with Paul. He was this historian. He talked about how, hey, I gathered eyewitnesses. I got their accounts all together, and I compiled this, this story from all that they told me. And then John, who was, the, who was an apostle, wrote seemingly later on in writing to people, to Christians who were being persecuted by Jewish unbelievers. And so we have these these four Gospels that were especially circulated and especially valued by the early church because they were a witness to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that came from the eyewitnesses. Even today, we have over 5,800 fragments or complete books of the New Testament handwritten in Greek, surviving to this day, okay? You know, from, from early centuries, from those first five, six, seven hundred years of Christianity. And that doesn't count the thousands of translations into other languages, the surrounding non-Greek speaking world, that, it was, that, the, that the New Testament was translated into. Uh, and these writings, these gospels, these accounts of Jesus became their scriptures. 
Now, when you look at these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are similar in a lot of ways. They tell, each of them tell the story of Jesus. But they are also different in a whole lot of ways. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, they're called the synoptic Gospels because they sort of are similar. And so uh, they, they take the stories and they order them all differently. In Matthew, this happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In Luke, this happened at the, at the end. And they, they order them differently and they add details. Some of them include stories, the others don't. Some of them include the same stories. In fact, there are some stories that if you look at I got to do this when I was in school, you know, studying Greek. Uh, I still have a, 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 it's called the, what do you call it? It's, the, it's a, I just, the, the word just left me, what you call it. But it has Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the stories written in Greek at, at the same time, so you can compare them all. And they, yeah, parallel, yes, I, that's not it. I'm sorry, that, but I was thinking of that too. That's not quite it. I'm sorry, I can't, can't remember. In any case, um, you can look at the stories and see, oh my goodness, this story, they basically said it word for word the same. It's almost like one copied the other. And then there's others. In fact, in fact you, look, you look at that and you think, okay, they had to have had a common source. You know, a lot of scholars think Mark wrote first and both Matthew and Luke at least had Mark with them. They, they kind of went off of as they were telling their story. I think that is very likely, very likely by the way, the way they're written. But also, there are stories that, that seem like the same story, but the details are different. It's, it's like at a, a different location or different people, but yet it's the same thing. And it's like, okay, either this is basically the same thing happening twice, or somebody got the details off or something. You know, there's, there's all these stories and there's these differences going, and you, you compare them together, and it's, it's really odd. And of course, you should, you should try this. Look at the accounts of Sunday morning when Jesus was raised, okay? At right, the, the Sunday morning after Jesus was raised in all the four Gospels. And just try to figure out who saw who, when, and what angels were involved, and how many of them, and when did they talk to who. And it's difficult, okay? It's real. I mean, people have harmonized them all. It does it's not seem natural, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a strange, strange deal when you try to harmonize them all. And so, in fact, there's been big books written on trying to harmonize all of the apparent differences there between the Gospels and between other books of the Bible. The huge things have been written on them. And so it really causes a, a struggle. What's, what's going on here? But it begins to make sense if, if you think about the fact, hmm, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, different people, writing in different places at different times to different groups of people for different purposes because the, the, the communities they were with had their different needs, and writing the story of Jesus. This is exactly what you would expect if these books were written by real human beings. The, the, the differences, the different perspectives, the different ways of using the story, it all makes sense if you realize these were written by actual human beings with actual uh, ideas, with actual flaws, with actual biases, with all that written by actual human beings. Now that can be disturbing, okay, because you say, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. If they're written by human beings, if this wasn't a matter of God is whispering in their ear exactly what for them to write down, how is it the Word of God? And if you, if you buy into that, then the way that it's the Word of God is, it, tell, it was a witness. It tells the story of Jesus. And it, it tells the story of Jesus in a way that if we enter into that story and we, we live the way of Jesus, we enter into the kingdom of God. But it's not, I do not believe. It's not the Word of God in the sense of, I open up the Bible, point at a verse, and God is directly speaking to me where I am. And this situation, I can open it up, oh, boom, there is God's Word directly to me. Now, do I believe it's God's Word? Do I believe that God can speak to me through that? Absolutely, absolutely. But that it's not so much a matter of uh, God whispering exactly what to say and everything. 
Okay, now so far I've really uh, dwelt on the four Gospels. I'll make sure I haven't left out anything that... Uh, Okay, I have. I've left out some important stuff. Let me, let me say this. Here's the thing that I, I think is really important to remember. Christianity created the Bible. The Bible did not create Christianity. Christianity grew from a conviction of the reality of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And because of that conviction, the Bible came into being. The Bible is not the basis for the Christian faith. The reality of Jesus and His resurrection is the basis for the Christian faith. The Bible is a collection of witnesses to that story, which is amazing. I mean, think about the fact that you and I can hold a book that is, and let me tell you, we have a high degree of certainty that what we have is very, very, almost exactly what was originally written. We could go into that, but we don't have time to go into that, okay? You and I have a copy. Yeah, translated into English, but if you know, you know ancient Greek, you can read it in Greek too. We have a copy of books written by the apostles, people who were with Jesus, and those who were with the apostles, with people who knew Jesus. We have, we, I mean, we can go that, it's like a time machine. We can go back in time and we can read the witnesses talk about Jesus, which is phenomenal, which is amazing, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's so valuable, so valuable to us for us to rely on, especially since we are separated by so many years and by such different culture. But since the Bible is a collection of witnesses to Jesus, if I discover, think about this, okay, if I discover what seems to me, okay, what seems to me to be an inconsistency in the Bible, or a different perspective, competing perspective, or something that doesn't seem like it goes together in the Bible, if it seems to me that there seems to be something inaccurate about a detail in the Bible, it does not shake my faith. Because my faith is not in an inerrant, inerrant no errors, in other words, inerrant, completely consistent, all seeing the same thing, picture a view of the Bible. That is actually a modern idea. The idea that the Bible itself is perfect in every way is a modern idea. This is a collection of witnesses of Jesus. They were people that wrote the Bible. Now, again, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm on this journey as well, and so I'm going to say some things strongly that I, I want you to understand. There's, there's room for a lot of discussion. Write down your questions. We, we can talk about them, okay? Uh, so I'm, so far, I've, I've, I've mostly focused on the Gospels, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's talk about the letters really quickly. They are letters written by the apostles to churches, to specific churches or specific groups of churches, who were experiencing specific problems, challenges, and so the apostles wrote to them. Now, the letters are these apostles applying the teachings of Jesus to those specific churches in those specific cultures with those specific problems. If I read the, the, the letters as if they are written directly to me in my culture, I am Putting, trying to make the Bible do something it simply is not designed to do. And you know this if you read it, because any women wearing jewelry? Any Christian women wearing jewelry? Okay, you assume that when Paul says women shouldn't wear jewelry, that that was a cultural thing, okay? You assume that, and you know what? I think you're right, okay? You assume that when Jesus says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer, how many of you men were lifting up hands as you prayed? Okay, you're assuming that that had a cultural thing going on there, okay? All of us, no matter what our church background, we do some things where we look at and say, okay, that's, that's a cultural issue, that's a cultural thing. And we are, that's absolutely true. These are the truths of, of Jesus applied to particular people in particular cultures. And so we have the responsibility of taking the teachings of Jesus and applying them to our 
particular culture and our particular situation where we were at. Can we learn from those letters? Absolutely. They are invaluable. We are able to see how the apostles applied the teachings of Jesus to specific situations, which is invaluable. But we can't try to transport ourselves into first century uh, Greek or Jewish uh, culture in order to uh, uh, understand them. The basic principles of Jesus stay the same. But the way that they are applied through history changes. That may make us uncomfortable, but it it is a reality. The goodness of Jesus is not locked in a time capsule. Now, we haven't even touched the Old Testament yet, okay? And this is where most, if if you're a skeptic, uh, this is probably where you have the most problems, is, is the teaching of the Old Testament. So real quickly, we'll try to address it. Here's the primary reason, the primary objective reason, I believe I take seriously, I should say, the Old Testament. Here's why I take seriously the Old Testament. Because Jesus did. Jesus learned the Old Testament. He taught from the Old Testament. He quoted the Old Testament. The Old Testament was important, a part of his teaching. And so, I do too. And subjectively speaking, I also take seriously the Old Testament because in my own personal experience, meditating on, studying, reflecting on what I read in the Old Testament has pointed me to God. And I've seen that. I've seen that happen in my own life. But I'll have to admit, there are disturbing things in the Old Testament to me. There are things in the Old Testament that perplex me, that confuse me, that in some cases horrify me. How old were you? when it dawned on you that parts of the Old Testament depict God as authorizing what we would call genocide. Yikes! You know, what was going on? And what is going on there? There's a, these events that are like, no, God, that just doesn't... I mean, that seems completely contrary to everything I know about Jesus, everything that Christianity teaches me. Well, how, how, how does this work? There are these disturbing things that we find in the, in the Old Testament. There's also seemingly competing theologies, competing teachings, themes that go on in the Old Testament. Let me give you just a, a couple of examples. Um, In Deuteronomy, uh, the the Israelites were taught, Moses taught the Israelites, that if they obeyed God, if they stayed faithful to the covenant that he had given them, that they would be blessed. Let me give you an example from Deuteronomy 28. Moses said, If you fully obey the Lord your God, carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Here you'll have all these blessings. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb, your children, will be blessed. And the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, your livelihood, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll have plenty to eat. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. You will be conquer- you'll conquer your enemies. They will come at you from one direction but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that He is giving you. Sum up. If you keep God's commands, stay faithful to Him, you will experience physical blessings of life. Good things will happen. Of course, we know that the history of the Israelites, they did not stay faithful to the covenant. They, did, they ended up getting taken into captivity because they continually rebelled, worshipped other gods and all that. But the teaching, you do what is right, God will bless you. And then we read the book of Job. A man who was very, very, very good, did what God commanded, loved God with all of his heart, and very, very bad things happened to him. And his good friends, all very good students of Deuteronomy, came to him and said, Job, we are so sorry that this is happening to you. You must have done something terrible. You know, we'll forgive you. Just repent of it. Whatever it is that you've done, just repent of it. Maybe God will have mercy on you and and will bless you again. But there was a problem. I mean, Job didn't claim to be perfect. But there's no big sin thing going, going on there. I mean, he loved God with all of his heart. He loved people. He, he obeyed what God's commands were. And so he became extremely frustrated 
and even angry with God and say, God, answer me. This is not right. This is not just. What are you doing? And, and he even challenged God. And God answered him and put him in his place. But after God put Job in his place, God said this to his three friends. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Timonot, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Here's the problem. The three friends had been defending God the entire book. They had been saying, no, God is right, God is just, whatever God has done. Because, and God says, look, Job is right. You guys are wrong. Just because you obey me and keep my commands does not mean that good things will always happen in your life. Bad things very well may happen. There is not a correlation between your righteousness and tragedy striking. Well, I'll give you one more example. Uh, the Assyrians in the 8th century were a, a uh, vicious conquering, ruthless people, okay? They oppressed the, the, the Israelites, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the uh, southern kingdom of Judah, oppressed the Israelites terribly. Here is a relief of, I don't know if you can tell what this is, but these are the Assyrians impaling people of Judah and carrying them around, waving their bodies around, okay? That's what they did to tell all their enemies, do not mess with us, this is what we do to you. And so the Israelites hated the Assyrians, as you can imagine. The prophet Nahum, okay, one of those obscure little prophets in the Old Testament, his entire little book is about the downfall of the city of Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, okay? And he talks about how the Assyrians are going to go down. They are going to be destroyed, and everybody will be happy about it. This is going to be a good thing. God is against you, and yay, Assyrians are going down. A couple books down, you read the book of Jonah. And God tells Jonah, I want you to go preach to the Assyrians. I want you to go preach to the city of Nineveh. And of course, Jonah says, no, I do not want to do that. He gets in a boat, goes the other way, and then God sends a storm and a fish, you might know the story, and changes Jonah's mind. And so Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh. And he preaches a four-second message. Uh, let me make sure I get this four-second message exactly right. Uh, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He'd say that. And he'd go to another part of the city. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And guess what? The city repented. The king, he, he put on sackcloth, sat in dust, d d dust, declared a fast, and the people turned, and Jonah was mad. Jonah was upset. See, God, I knew this is what would happen. You know, he wanted the Assyrians to go down. But then the book ends with God asking Job a question. Should not I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also many animals. Can you at least care about the animals, in the, Jonah? You know? um, what, what, is he, what is he saying? What is the teaching? That God cares about them too. Now, one explanation of why these might be different is the different times in which they're written. Nahum wrote right there in the midst of the whole Assyrian oppression and everything. Jonah, the book was most likely written, uh, most scholars think anyway, during the exile or after the exile where the Israelites had lived with the foreigners. They had lived with these people that they had hated and probably got to know a couple of them. What happens when you're, there's this group of people that you tend to not like and think that they're bad, and then you form a relationship with one of them? And then things change. Maybe, maybe God cares about them too. See, what we see in the Old Testament, and this makes most of us who grew up, grew up in, in modern church extremely uncomfortable, okay? But what we see in the Old Testament is a conversation, even debate. What happens when you get a few Christians together talking about God issues? You have complete agreement, right? No, no. Now, you, you agree on some basic things. There are some basic things about Christianity you agree on. And there's a bunch of things that you debate about that you think, no, I, I really think it's this one. No, I think it's this one. And, you, you know, the way I grew 
uh, more than anything during my young adulthood life was through arguing with people. That's why I'd love to argue so much. It's a bad quality, I know, but no, I mean arguing in a, with friends. With friends who understood things differently than me. And I'd argue with them, and we'd debate, and, and, and even though I would state my case, I'd think about what they would say to me, and you know what? In some cases, in a lot of cases, over time, I changed my mind. I changed my mind, and that whole process, I grew, I matured, that was it began to happen to me. In the Old Testament, we see the people of Israel, Israel means struggle with God. We see the Israelites struggling with God, and they're growing, and they're struggling, and they're, and they're maturing. Up to the time where Jesus comes onto the scene. And Jesus says, you are to love your enemy. Not only does God care about your enemy, you are to love them and you are to pray for them. Not only might good, bad things happen to you if you're a good person, Jesus said, if you follow me, very likely more bad things will happen to you because you follow me. I mean, there, there is no guarantee of physical blessings, at least in some ways, there's no guarantee of any physical blessings simply because you follow me, though you will be blessed. And so Jesus kind of comes onto the scene and enters into this debate, enters into this struggle of Israel, and he changes the conversation. No longer do we ask the question, do I love my enemy or not? Now we ask the question, what needs to happen inside of me so that I can? And if you're, you're uh, disturbed by the difference, you know, if you come to the Old Testament, especially if you're you know, a skeptic and you come to the Old Testament and you see things there that just, it's, that seem completely opposite to what Jesus said, look, Jesus was very well aware that his teachings were different than some of the teachings of the Old Testament. Jesus was known for saying, you have heard it said, but I tell you. You have heard it said, but I tell you. He was very aware of the contrast uh, between what he was saying and some of the things that the people had been, uh, had been taught. So, the Christian faith does not rest on a particular view of the Bible that says everything must harmonize exactly as if every part of it was directly from the voice of God. The Christian faith rests on the reality that Jesus came and he lived and he taught and he died and he rose from the dead. And we have witnesses. And we can trust that what he says is true. Our faith rests on Jesus, not on a modern view of the Bible. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I, I recognize that not only does this perhaps make some of us uncomfortable, that this would have made me very uncomfortable not all that long ago. And so um, I just pray that you help us as we seek to grow, as we seek to, to mature, as we seek to, to better understand you and your will for our life, that you help us as we seek to understand what the Bible is and how you intend for it to work in our lives. Because God, we have seen the power of these witnesses for many of us in our life, those of us who are Christians, we have seen how powerful these stories and these teachings are because they witness to Jesus. And God, for, for those of us here who, who are not sure if we believe in God or not, or maybe our faith in God has, has been damaged because we found something in the Bible that, that just doesn't make sense to us. God, I, I pray that you will help us seek truth and help us realize that so many times when we think we're walking away from Christianity, that oftentimes we're walking away from a certain version of Christianity that may not be right. It certainly may not be right in every way. And so give us wisdom, guide us, lead us, 
Help us to learn. Help us to grow, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.